Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing today? My name is Craig Deleuze, and I would like to welcome you to the Thirsty Thursday edition of The Rundown. But now, as you all know, I do not do this program by my lonesome. No, no, you get assistance from me. My name is Mike Paworski. I'm coming to you from the, the East Coast. That's the coast with the most, as we've, as we've, as we've proven time after time. Uh, <laughs> it is going to be a challenge today to keep, that, uh, to keep that theory in practice, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I am the co-host. I am here to assist you and bring you the rundown. Yes, yes, yes. So, sir, any special plans for Thirsty Thursday? Woo, let's see. Thirsty Thursday is, uh, it's, you know, I guess the first day, the first full day of the weekend uh, mm -hmm. is how we like to celebrate it here, uh, which means I'll probably only work about eight or ten hours of it uh, continuing. Let's see. I'm already about six hours into it. I'll work probably till around midnight tonight. Uh, and, um, yeah, you know, it's just got to do what you got to do. Well, today I'm actually, I, I shared with you over the weekend that I actually picked up an interesting bottle of bourbon, uh, the it, uh, uh, America's, America, America, yep. America. Yep. They call it America. America with an M. Yep, yep. I, I prefer to pronounce it America, America's That's bourbon. It. So America. my yep, yep. plan today is to actually give that a taste and I can uh, I can give you a review tomorrow. Those are good, 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 good guys. Met them at Shot Show about three years ago, three or four years ago. Came by the booth up on Radio Row, uh, showed us their products, sat and talked with them for quite a while. Uh, good people, I think. Uh, as long as the recipe has remained the same, Craig, you should uh, you should have a good, enjoyable uh, tasting today. I am very much looking forward to that. Very much looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to our special guest host today for this. Thursday, Thursday edition of The Rundown. Uh, we met several years ago. Uh, this is a guy, and, and I'll just say this. You know, I always say whenever you, you know, Mike, we always get people who are like trying to get us or national groups to come and do stuff in their area, in their community, and, right. and advocate in their areas, right? Yes. Uh, but this is a guy who saw a need and got to work and started making an impact. And I'm gonna tell you, in a place like California where it's hard to make an impact on gun laws, this guy and his organization are doing it. And so with that, I would like to uh, introduce to the program, Mr. Michael Schwartz of San Diego County Gun Owners. Thanks for having me, awesome intro. Uh, we, sir, I, I did not even do you justice. That's, that's you know, just, just so you know, I just so much appreciate the work that you guys are doing there in San Diego. You bet. Yeah, happy to do it. Looking Excellent. forward so, to uh, telling more people about it. It's it's uh, really an honor and a, and a privilege. Excellent. So do me a favor. Uh, let folks know a little bit about San Diego County Gun Owners and what it is that you do there. Sure. So we're six years old. We have uh, 2,900 members and growing. Um, and we're a political organization, but we focus just on Second Amendment issues and uh, just locally. So when we looked around to see, you know, hey, how can we help the fight? There are a lot of great organizations uh, that are looking after federal and looking after, uh, you know, state Second Amendment issues. And we didn't want to duplicate what they're doing. What we wanted to do was uh, something that wasn't being done. So we looked around and, and thought, you know, geez, a lot of the people that are serving in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., they started out on a city council or a school board somewhere. And no one's really paying attention. They just don't have the bandwidth to these local races. So we decided we're going to raise enough people and money, uh, enough resources to get vetted candidates elected on local boards and councils who are pro Second Amendment. And we're nonpartisan. We don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, declined to state, libertarian, whatever. We don't care. We just want you to respect our Second Amendment rights. And that was the basic idea. But along the way, we've we've done a whole lot more, including engaging with local media, you know, your six o'clock news and print and radio and TV. Uh, we've set up shooting programs. We've set up uh, a, a program for women who uh, to help stop domestic violence and sexual assault by making sure that any woman who needs and wants gets a gun, gets training and gets a CCW. Um, and we've expanded. We now have Orange County gun owners and Riverside County gun owners and San Bernardino County gun owners. And uh, it's just been a, a really amazingly successful. Sir, and you know, but that's what I mean when I talk about the epitome of, you know, local, of, of the idea of when you see a need, uh, start doing it and then build relationships with other groups and other organizations so that you can... because. There's stuff that you're doing that groups like FPC or NRA can't do. And there's stuff that they're doing that you can't do. 
And so by building those relationships is phenomenal. And now there, there's an event that you guys just had last weekend. Uh, it, it's, it's the it's second, I forget what the official name is. All I know is the unofficial name that all of us call it is gun prom. Right. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it started out as our second amendment celebration dinner. And uh, the first one we had was a few hundred people. And they were all people, we, we all kind of knew each other, knew each other from the range or knew each other from the, the trenches. And for one night, we all got, you know, you know we hosed ourselves off and uh, got nice and dressed up. And it was in the spring and it got, it quickly got nicknamed gun prom. So <laughs> we, uh, I, I went with it. If you go to gunprom.com, you'll see details on our, uh, on our dinner. Nice. And this year's, uh, we had to postpone it last year because of all the COVID restrictions. So this one. Uh, happened Saturday night, and we had a thousand people wow. at our at our dinner, and uh, you know there were prizes and awards for hardworking folks, and uh, you know some entertainment and fun, and it was it was really really great. It was uh, touching speeches and powerful speeches and uh, awards for people that have been working extremely hard. You know we don't we don't chip around at the edges. We don't uh, you know we're not a, a sportsman's club or a hunter's club. We're a hard-hitting political action organization. And uh, I, I tell people, we're not a scalpel. We're a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. All right. Well, with that, look, hey, by the way, if you want to get information on, uh, want to know, learn, learn more about San Diego County gun owners, or, uh, you know, maybe talk with them about trying to start the same thing where you're at, uh, just they're, his, they're, the information is in the description to this video. So you'll find it there. All right. So... Yeah, I've, I've got I've got a San Diego question. I've just you know because you you know how you know how I am. We get somebody on from different locale, different region, and I've, and I've got information I need to know. Um, so so Mike, what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, th this year the Padres started off uh, you know on gangbusters coming out of the coming out of the gate. You know, one of the top three leaders in the National League West out there, heading up against the Dodgers and the Giants, and then just faded at the at the halfway mark. I know you just released your manager, but you still got you know the three hundred and forty million dollar man there. You got you got uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. <laughs> you've got uh, Machado. You've got Darvish. You guys you guys have eyes on a manager yet? And what's your plans for next year? How are you guys going <laughs> to compete out there in the West? You know we have the exact same plans uh, every year for next year, <laughs> which is uh, this time we're going to win. That's the plan. There you um, go. I don't know the specifics, but oh man, there was so much hope. Uh, people were so excited. Keep hope and, alive. Keep hope yeah. alive. And it just, uh, it was like uh, the fan, they were like the, uh, you know, Major League. Remember the movie Major League? Yep. yep. Yeah. Th those were our fans, man. People in the, you know, just like getting all fired up. Um, but uh, it just didn't happen. But, uh, you know, people, people, I, San Diego has some of the uh, best fans out there. And, uh, you know, they were supportive all the way to the end, but you know, the reality was it just didn't work out. Wow. So I, I don't know what they're going to do again, every year, right around this time, there's a bunch of articles written about how, you know, next year's the year and here we go. So. It's a, that's it. Right. Exactly. Right. Well, you guys got to, the, you have the leg up. You've got one of the futures of baseball there in your organization. And as long as they don't trade away Fernando, you guys, uh, should be in the news every yeah. day. You know, it yeah. seems like I'm, I'm trying not to say it out loud, though. I feel like, I mean, it really truly feels like the guy is a legend in the making. Yeah. And, uh, but it, I, I also feel like if if we talk about it, it'll, uh, you know, he's yes. going to get hit by a bus tomorrow or something. Yeah, because he, uh, <laughs> he, seem, he seems to be a little fragile, a little more fragile you know, than, he, than okay. he should be. We have so. invested entirely more, too much time talking baseball. Oh, oh, sorry. No, we have not. We have not. We have not. We could, we could put the guns off and talk baseball. Craig. Um, all right, Craig, I'll let you take us into the next story. I know you like the next story, Craig. Okay, so this was okay. So this is a story that I picked out. Um, so I was listening to this on a local radio show, and it gave me a chance to go ahead and actually encourage me to go ahead and read the article over there at the Atlantic. Um, so here's the story. Now. If you've ever, you know, dealt with or, or you spent some time understanding methamphetamine and exactly what it is, you know that it causes, with long-term use, it causes mental health issues. It causes things like uh, things like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Well, there's a uh, because of the inability or the how hard it is to get ephedrine, which is kind of one of the key ingredients that used to go into uh, used to go into meth. 
Um, and you know, I, I, anyway, but, but it's one of the main ingredients. So, uh, they've actually started using a chemical, uh, known as P2P. And if you've watched, uh, Breaking Bad, you've heard of P2P before, but it's a chemical that they can use. It's easier to get, uh, that helps them to create, uh, create meth. Well, what they're finding is, and what this study is, is basically this is a, an article outlining kind of the studying of this P2P meth over the last decade. And they found that it's gone from, uh, from the usage of it taking, uh, causing mental health, causing, uh, taking uh, years to it literally taking weeks and months. And what this article does is it points to the increase in the, the, the P2P meth being the drug of choice and how it is actually at the core of the dramatic increase in homelessness in these United States. Uh, it, it's really crazy because you know you have you have liberals all want to go and talk about oh it's the price of housing and it's you know people losing their jobs and income inequality. But really what we're finding is, it's what most of us have kind of come to believe, is that it's both a mental health issue, but it's also fueled by a drug addiction issue. Well, I... You know, uh, let, let me let me uh, Mike. Let me let you take this first. Uh, I, I've got. I think my opinion is a little bit different than Craig's on this, so I'll let you guys uh, jump off, and then uh, maybe I give you mine, and we can fight about it. Well, it, you know, in San Diego, it's it's it, it, it's been really interesting. I, I I worked right in the center of downtown, and I parked just about eight blocks from the center of downtown, and I went right through the the homeless uh, encampments on my way to to where I was parking, and I, I saw it firsthand, and. What I what I what I saw was uh, people who were clearly having some kind of uh, you know mental crisis on the streets, um, and I can only assume that it was caused by by drugs. I mean, you'd see needles and stuff like that right in the streets, right in the right in the streets in San Diego. Now, this is all you know, just my personal experience. I certainly don't have any studies to back this up, but it, it's it's something I saw every single day uh, for years working downtown. And you read in the papers that hey, uh, we need we need affordable housing. Well, I really don't. The homeless people I saw, which when I say homeless people, I'm not talking two or three. You know, these were dozens and, and maybe into the hundreds. And they, you know, it's not like they were just looking for an affordable pad. You know, it was a true crisis. Uh, so I don't really. I, what I haven't really truly seen um, is, uh, and I don't know. There are a lot of numbers to back this up. I haven't really seen that uh, that it truly, truly is a matter of hey, there's some people down on their luck and they just can't afford a home. Um, every every indicator seems to be that this is a some kind of mental health crisis caused by drugs. Uh, and you know the uh, solution, the government solution, that just seems to be delusional. They keep talking about you know creating more and more affordable housing. Now, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great goal. I think that, you know, starter homes for young families and, you know, people that want to, you know, getting, getting into real estate is great, but I think they're missing the, the actual problem. And I don't know it, the, the, the drug problem in the United States is, is the solution is way above my pay grade. It, it has really gotten out of control. Yeah, you know, I think this is a couple of different things we're looking at, uh, Craig here, uh, and it's 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 ironic the uh, uh, the ties to the Breaking Bad in there with the uh, the methodology for creating this this new type of meth. Uh, you know, that was that was pretty interesting in the story, but but I, I'll, I'll tell you, listen, the, the drugs now, Craig, are uh, is this meth more powerful than the meth of twenty years ago? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, is heroin more powerful than it was twenty years ago? Of course. Even the marijuana is because now that it's becoming legal in many jurisdictions, they're finding ways to get more power out of it so they can cut it back and uh, and make more money off of it. So even the you know the as things as as, as subtle as the marijuana have become more powerful and and and, and mind altering. Um, I think a lot of the homeless problem, when you look around the country, you see the larger homeless camps, the larger homeless shelters are in those cities, again, that have those liberal policies that allow for the homeless population to exist, where the solution becomes, like we see in New York City, let's give every homeless person a place to live. You know, whether that's occup the city occupying hotels and, uh, and apartment buildings, uh, their, their solution was to just put them somewhere, to basically hide them off the street inside of a building. Uh, well, 
Guess what happens when you start to give free things away to people that refuse to earn anything, Craig? Um, we This is why we don't feed animals at the park, right? You know, because then they get used to it and they won't work for their food. Uh, this is what's going on in many major metropolitan liberal cities. You come to the, you come to the Republican-controlled cities, you come to the conservative-controlled cities, and you do not see that same extent of homelessness that you see where the two of you gentlemen live. Okay, we don't have that here uh, in, 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 in the conservative lands. All right. Um, the other thing that's in there, and, and I'm telling you that's going to make this even worse, is uh, the veteran population, the veteran homeless population. Now, we have, a, uh, we have a, a huge population we know of the entitled generation. Well, you know what? It's too hard for me, so I'll just let the government provide. Well, we've lost the conservative leadership uh, in, in the White House. We've lost the support of the military from this administration. That is clear. You've got members right now that are combat heroes and been in 15, 20, 25 years that are being shown the door because they said, I think I might like to look at getting an exemption for a vaccination. And so they're discharging and they're throwing them on the streets with no benefits. All right. So this administration does not care what's going on with our veterans. It's only going to make this worse. And I'm sorry, I don't believe that catering and trying to find a home for everybody that has no drive and has given up is the solution to this. I'm not saying I know the answer, but I'm saying coddling those that refuse to do anything for themselves is not the right answer. I don't think you, at least you don't get any disagreement from me at all. Uh, all I'm pointing to is, is just looking at is for part of the thing is people don't want to acknowledge that you know, that a drug addiction is a major issue it's, and it's leading to the crime issue. And the fact that one, we don't want to, we, we don't want to stigmatize people who are homeless as being drug addicts. When uh, in, in, in several cities, they've done studies and they've determined that 90% of uh, the homeless people. And when I say homeless, I mean, the people who are on the streets are in fact uh, drug addicted. And oh, right. by the way, a huge majority of them have multiple run-ins, meaning meaning they've been confronted by, arrested by, and then released by law enforcement multiple sure. times. Yeah. There's 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 links there. And if we don't deal with, and by the way, and then you also have law enforcement folks who will tell you, look, the only time these folks clean up is when they're put in jail, when they're put in county jail and they don't have access to the drugs that they have access to on the streets. That's when they, in fact, clean up. But we don't want to stigmatize folks. But in not stigmatizing them, yeah. we're also not helping them. Yeah, but do do, do drugs cause homelessness? You know, uh, obviously, if you get bad enough into meth, you can, you can go from top of the game to bottom of the world in months. I've seen right. that happen many times in the, in the law enforcement world. Um, I get that, but does does drugs keep you homeless? Does it make you stay homeless? I, I don't know. I remember what was the comedian, um, Greg Gerardo uh, or Geraldo. He when he was talking about Hurricane Katrina, he, you know, people were saying you've got these people that are without homes down there stealing beer, and his his response was, well, yeah, I think if I was living in a uh, in a in a canoe uh, and the only way I could get relief was to steal a couple of beers and get buzzed, I might do that also. Uh, you know, is, is that the reason right. for the homelessness doing the drugs? Is it because, listen, everybody has turned their back on me and I'm living here in the alley and I'm either getting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, bit by rats or raped by some lunatic. Maybe I want to have a, you know, a little meth to release for a little while. I don't know. You know, I don't know which one causes the other, but I know the, the current solution that we have mm -hmm. in place in liberal cities does not work. Right. Listen, and, and, and the toleration that we have in the, uh, uh, in the more conservative towns, I can say that uh, you know the homelessness problem here is ten times what you have out there in California, mm -hmm. or ten times less than what you have there in California. What I will say is this: is you're, you you're right. This this could potentially be a chicken and the egg conversation. And my whole thing is is I I don't know that one causes the other. What I know is is that they are linked, and you cannot fix sure. one without fixing the other. I agree. I, I, yeah. I do kind of wonder sometimes if maybe, you know, drugs is is not the problem, but it's the symptom. And, you know, I, I wonder if it's too too deep to wonder why so many people have a need for drugs and why so many people have a financial need to sell drugs. And I don't know how fixable that is. And again, I don't know how deep and philosophical it is to wonder, like, what's missing in people's lives that they have to do drugs. Right. Yeah. Well, and that, and that, and that is a, a an issue for I think further down the line that needs to be addressed. Um, but right now in crisis mode, we got to figure out how do we address the issue 
uh, that, that right now seems to be exploding in particular in America's uh, in America's major cities and is, by the way, starting to spill out even to suburban uh, communities. Yeah, I think that short term answer might have to be. Uh, and, and listen, you've got a lot of other problems you've got to address, like, you know, you, you have zero bond issues out there right now or zero bail issues. You know, you break the law, you go to jail. Does that does that increase the jail population? Sure, it does. Um, but you know what? You, you take the money that you were you know giving to give free free things to the homeless and now put it towards their uh, uh, their their reintroduction to society classes back in jail. I, I don't know, Craig, again, I don't have the playbook in front of me, but I can tell you. Where, where we have a law and order society, we have less homeless. I'll tell you one of the things, there was a, a special that I saw about a year or so ago where they were talking about this in Seattle and what they, they were comparing it to a pilot program that was done somewhere in Rhode Island where uh, if you got picked up you, and, and you, were, you were a drug addict, you had, one, you had one or two choices. You either went to jail or you went to a prison facility that was modified to be a drug rehabilitation center. You did right. one or the other. Yeah. But you weren't just going to, it wasn't just, okay, well, we're just going to let you back out on the streets. I don't know if the program yeah. is still up and running, but at the time, what they found, what they found tremendous success with reducing the homeless population. So I don't yeah. know if they're still doing it. I don't know what the modern, uh, what, the, what the current status of it is, but it, they did demonstrate that sometimes uh, forcing folks to get help, at least temporarily, can alleviate their situation. At least clear their minds so that they can start to figure out if, the, you know, if they're going to be productive members of society or not. Sounds like a good plan to me. Let's give it a shot. All right. Well, why don't you go ahead and lead us into our next story? Who our good friend, the attorney general in Louisiana, Tom, or excuse me, Jeff Landry. Jeff Landry is the attorney general in Louisiana. Now, Craig, we recently saw this in Texas. Uh, this got enacted in Texas not too long ago under law. But uh, the attorney general in, in, uh, in, in Louisiana has got some news for the likes of J.P. Morgan and anyone else uh, in, that, in that type of industry. So what's what's gone on, folks, is uh, last year was it a year and a half ago? The uh, the J.P. Morgan had to testify uh, in front of uh, U.S. Congress, and one of the things that J the chairman uh, Jamie Dimon, it's Jamie Dimon, is the uh, uh, he's the chairman or uh, the CEO. I'm sorry of uh, of J.P. Morgan told U.S. Congress that we do not. That we do not, uh, we do not give money to those, uh, or we do not deal with those that produce military-style weapons for the civilian population. So he came right out and said, "We do not believe, and we do not give money, or deal with money, or finance those that that manufacture military-style weapons for the civilian population." Well, then he came back the, this past year and said, "Hey, Louisiana." We'd like to do business with you. We understand you need somebody to back a bond project and you know do this hundred million dollar deal and and back that for you. And and Attorney General Jeff Landry said, "Hold on a second now. We've got some questionnaires for you if you'd like to do this bond issue with us. Do you support and defend the Constitution of the United States, or do you, do you or do you plan on violating anybody's rights here in the state of Louisiana?" And they said, "No, no, of course not. We'd never do that." And he and then he gave the quote. And he's presented the quote to J.P. Morgan. He's presented the quote to Jamie Dimon there at, at J.P. Morgan and is awaiting their response to find out what they meant by, no, we do support the Constitution. We'd never violate anybody's rights. Oh, except for, you know, the right to protect themselves, the right to keep and bear arms. So we're kind of in a holding pattern waiting for J.P. Morgan in Louisiana. And it's, it's going to be fun to watch, exciting to watch. <laughs> Yes, it will definitely be interesting to watch. And it's, you know, once again, and, I, and I've said this a number of times, you know, we should not be discriminating against uh, individuals. We shouldn't allow businesses to discriminate against individuals who are seeking to do nothing more than facilitate the exercising of a constitutional right. Uh, it, it, I don't think any government should be doing business with individuals who decide to do that. And I don't think we as individuals, as, as much as we can, because nowadays you have companies all over the place. I mean, if, if I boycotted every anti-gun company, um, well, I wouldn't even, we wouldn't even be able to do this program. That's how, that's how bad it is in yeah. terms of companies that, that violate it. But, um, but I think it's vitally important that uh, to get states like Texas and like Louisiana standing up for the right to keep and bear arms. Well, this, we, do you guys have this happen in California at all? Is this going on in Northern California, Southern California, where you guys are? 
I was going to say big time. Uh, it happens big time. And when we started San Diego County Gun Owners, uh, we made it really, really crystal clear that we're not a, a club. This isn't a hobby. Um, you know, you know, we're not a group of sportsmen. I mean, we may include all those people, you know, right. the, the folks that, you know, do it as a hobby or are sportsmen. They may include that uh, or, or in our membership. They are a big part of our membership for sure. But we're not a club supporting, you know, a hobby or, or a sport. Right. Uh, we're a civil rights organization. And we take that very, very seriously. Um, we're here to defend a civil right, and it is not a second-class right. It's it's an extremely important right. It's your, not just your right to keep and bear arms, but it's how you are able to defend your life. And uh, there really, truly is no other rights matter if if you don't have if you don't have life, if you're not alive and able to defend yourself and protect yourself. So um, the idea that, hey, um, you know, a business gets to discriminate against someone for practicing their civil rights, we've already fought that battle back in the 60s. And, yeah. uh, you know, we need to definitely draw a clear line to our civil right uh, and their so the, the civil right uh, uh, movement back in the 60s as far as, um, you know, the, the results, which is, hey, look, you cannot discriminate against somebody um, commercially, uh, you know, or, or through government because they're exercising a civil right. And I, I don't, I think that uh, for too long, there was in, in the gun rights world for decades, frankly, there was a, uh, an idea that, hey, that was maybe too strong a message. You know, the, the, uh, the, the thought of, hey, I'm carrying a gun in case I have to defend my life was a little too strong and and people thought well let's just talk about tradition and hunting let's talk about sport and mm -hmm. it's fun and that's great but i i, I we're in, we're in different times and we right. need to relate to people who disagree with us and right. uh very typically the people who disagree with us do value the idea of civil rights um so drawing that connection and showing them that bridge to to agree with us i think is extremely important well, you know, when you see, I mean, you had you had it happen there with uh, Del Mar trying to get rid of uh, trying to get rid of gun shows. Uh, we've seen it at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, where there is absolutely no place within all of the city or county of San Francisco for individuals to be able to purchase firearms. Uh, so the, the the gun shows at the Cow Palace are literally the only opportunity that someone who is doesn't have the ability to get out of the city has to actually be able to go and and facilitate the exercising of a constitutional right. Uh, it's it's it is beyond crazy. And you know you've got businesses after businesses that are going against our rights, and it's and 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 governmental entities and governmental entities are making it easier for businesses to be able to violate our constitutional rights. Uh, and it's important that we stand up. And that's why I appreciate uh, what this AG is doing. And I appreciate the work that, that once again, the groups like uh, San Diego County gun owners are doing uh, to hold folks accountable. That's it. That's it. Craig, uh, Mike, let's roll into our last topic here. We don't want to keep the folks around for uh, too much longer today. We talk about vaccines and vaccine mandates, and one of them out there is in is in California. Let me give you guys quick facts here and get some uh, get some opinions from you. We know that Southwest Airlines, remember it was a week ago, two weeks ago, they were having weather delays in the clear air out there out west, and something like three to 5,000 flights canceled over this. Um, and, and why is there an estimate there of three to 5,000? Because I think there were a couple of weather delays in there, but they're not sure which ones uh, were legitimate or not. Um, November 24th, Southwest has said, that's your deadline. You've got to get your vaccination or uh, you become an unpaid employee. Uh, well, they've changed that now to uh, you if you want to apply for an exemption. So whether that be a religious, a medical, whatever that exemption may be, you can now apply for that exemption and get uh, um you get to wait. So when you go, if you, you don't get unpaid leave. So as long as your exemption is applied for by the 24th, that you get to stay on paid status and they have no deadline at this point to figure out the status of your exemptions. So they've kind of given them an out is what it looks like. All right. Uh, we'll get you guys opinion on that. And then out in LA uh, city of Los Angeles, uh, they've decided because they also were one of the cities that said, get your vaccine or you're, or you're fired. Uh, well, they've, they've decided, and this is, um, Mike Zazbo, Zazabo, he's the uh, city admin officer out there in Los Angeles, that they're going to now give you 
you can get two tests a week for COVID. You'll have to take two tests a week for COVID, and that's through December 18th. So you'll have to pay for the tests. They're $65 a piece. That's twice a week you'll have to get them done. Uh, you cannot do them on company time or city time. And you can do this up until December 18th, where you get to figure out if you're going to get your vaccination or lose your job. And, and to show the attitude of the city out there, this, this Mike Sosmo, the city admin officer, said, hey, listen, this is your last, best, and final offer. You know, like it's a joke. Like it's, a, like it's nothing to him, and he doesn't care, and the city has said, hey, it's your last, best, and final offer. Take it or leave it. What do you guys think? What's, what's your think on the, you know, the, the vaccination? You know, my, my, my personal opinion is I think, I think we're saturated. I think the people that are going to get vaccinations have gotten them, and everybody left, it's going to be a fight. You know, I, I think the I actually did an interview with local with a local news station and I talked about that. I think that the vaccines are safe and effective and probably a really good idea for for most people. And I'm not getting it. Uh, and the reason I'm not getting this is I did this interview close to a year ago. And the reason I'm not getting it is I don't feel comfortable with uh, the idea of a government mandate. And the interviewer asked me, well, how are you going to know when it's not required? You know, how are you going to know when government isn't requiring it? And I said, well, that's that's the question. But frankly, I'm someone who probably should get a vaccine. Um, I'm probably someone who won't who wouldn't fare well if I caught uh, COVID or developed pneumonia. And uh, but it's important to me to put my my life uh, on on the line when it comes to defending against government overreach and when it comes to defending my own liberty and freedom. And I certainly don't, uh, you know, judge or blame anybody for, for deciding to get the vaccine, but I'm extremely proud of people who, st who are standing up and saying, hey, this isn't necessarily about the vaccine and what I think of the vaccine or what I think of science or, you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry. This is about the idea of a government saying, hey, unless you get a Unless you put a drug in your body, you're not allowed to. Uh, you're not allowed to, to work. Um, that's so fundamentally wrong. And I, I think in five or ten years from now, we're going to look back on this and 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 think about how ridiculous it was that this was even being uh, asked of us. So uh, you know, I, I think it's great. That I was really really proud of Southwest and their pilots and uh, for standing up and saying, "Hey, this is enough." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Craig, what you thinking? Uh, well, I, I'm quite frankly, I, I think I, I think that they are in retreat. I think they're realizing that there are enough people out there and these are not all, you know, these are not all Trump supporters, but there's enough people out there who are standing up and saying no to uh, government telling you what chemicals or forcing you to put chemicals in your body. I mean, you know, it's, it's sad because you always get them comparing it to regular or to, to the vaccines that are required for kids to go to school. But I'm like, look, those vaccines were around for decades before anybody mandated them. And as far as I know, I don't know that they're mandated in all states in order to be able to attend school. And then on top of it, they want to remove any exemption, any religious exemptions. And many people are filing religious exemptions because, well, they used uh, they used human embryos, aborted human fetuses uh, in order to in order to manufacture this vaccine. And so therefore, they have a religious objection to it. Um, my thing is, is that is removing that and not allowing people to have exemptions. It's like, I, I am frustrated because, I, you know, I'm a person, I decided to get the vaccine and I got it because I believe, I believe it to be safe and I believe it to be, uh, I believe it to be effective. Having said that, uh, I made that choice. My wife made that choice and every individual ought to be able to make that choice for themselves. And the idea of saying, well, you're not going to get to work if you don't get it because you might spread it. Well, guess what? If you get vaccinated, you can still get it. If you get vaccinated, you can still spread it. And then the idea that you're going to mandate multiple times per week, people getting tested. Wait a minute. Um, and then oh, and they have to pay for it. Well, why are we still not testing then people who actually got vaccinated? Because guess what? They can still get it and they can still spread it. It's like the idea of following the science has just completely and utterly, that, that's not a thing anymore. Following the science is no longer a thing. We're now going to ignore science in order to implement government will. And now you're, what you're seeing is you're seeing them say, well, 
you know, they're already rolling out plans to vaccinate uh, between five and uh, between the five-year-olds and 19-year-olds. Now, let me tell you this, Mike, and I just got some new data. Guess how many people have died from the from under the age, 19 and under, how many people have died from COVID uh, in the la- since the beginning? From purely from COVID? Yes. Without any other existing factors? I'll probably go yes. with zero. Uh, less than 10. Yeah. Less than 10. Out of 330 million people in the United States, yep. less than 10. Okay, and but you can't say the total population numbers. You're skewing it. You have to go with those that were infected. Even if you go with those who are infected. I mean, come on. It's, right. Right. Yeah. It, is out, it is outrageous that we are now going to force a chemical. And by the way, and as we yeah. said, as we continue to say, we don't know the long-term effects. And you will never know the long-term effects until you... Time passes. That's how you find out long-term effects. You can't study them if you don't have the, the amount of time to be able to do it. But now we're going right. to force ke- those chemicals. We're going to force chemicals into individuals who have almost literally almost no chance of, of getting severely sick or dying uh, from COVID. Yeah. That's, again, it's a per- personal issue. I agree. It doesn't matter. Listen, I'm sitting here on the, on the monitor between somebody who's had it and has not had the vaccination for the various reasons. And I'm fine with that. It's your decision. It's your individual decision to do that. Uh, you know, like what Craig and I have said to you since day one, talking vaccinations. And I'm sure as we all have the conversation daily in our lives, uh, make an educated decision. You know, do that with your family. Do that with your medical professionals. Uh, and that's it. I, I, I personally don't believe I should be getting a vaccine for one that's government mandate. That's a huge, important deal for me. And two, um, why am I getting a vaccine for something when there's a, there's adequate uh, you know treatments available on the table? Um, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, uh, those vaccines are in place and they're mandatory for children because there are no cures. You get those diseases and you could die or be severely crippled for life. All right. That happens. I get COVID, you know what happens? I get a prescription for ivermectin or Regeneral or the uh, monoclonal and I'm fine. Um, because those exist. This is like trying to create a vaccine for headaches. I don't need a vaccine for headaches. I just want to get a headache. I'll take two aspirin. I'll be fine. Oh, but and let's, let us not forget natural immunity, which is completely and utterly disregarded in any of these mandates. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So anyway, it uh, is what it is. It's, uh, to me, it's the first shot over the bow. It's one of the things that's been really revealing about the whole issue with COVID is we see what happens. We see what the left does when they believe that there is a crisis. All rights go out the window. All logic and reason go out the window, and they use it as a reason to implement policies that they always wanted to implement anyway. Oh, didn't we see it halfway around the country, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, we have a COVID two weeks lockdown. Um, no gun sales. We have to suspend gun sales. Right. What? What? <laughs> it's oh, not by the way, Mike, I, I, I totally forgot. Now, normally... So, so, Michael, normally when we do our COVID stories, we, we lead into them with our uh, COVID story announcement. I totally forgot to do it this time. Whoopies! <laughs> Coronavirus! <laughs> God, gotta love Cardi B. <laughs> she great. She great, yeah. She yeah, great, she yeah. great, she great. Hey, how tall is Cardi, by the way? I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to look it up here real quick while you're entering the next story. Okay. Well, next comes our, uh, next comes our parting shot. Um. And this is I probably comes out completely out of left field. But as soon as I saw this, I was like, okay, uh, we will be celebrating this in the Deleuze household as uh, October 21st is officially, it is officially throw a national throw a short, throw short people day. So on October 21st, you can throw anyone under five foot four uh, with no permission needed. Uh, now, just so you guys know, in, in the Deleuze household currently, uh, there is my wife, there is my daughter, there is my granddaughter, and my mother-in-law, who all qualify to celebrate, <laughs> who all qualify to celebrate National Throw, Throw Short People Day. Uh, we, will be, we will be celebrating it. Uh, uh, hopefully, I will live through the experience uh, with, well, when, when, when I celebrate it with my wife. See, that's a mandate I support right there. <laughs> Uh, Craig, for the record, uh, Cardi B's 5'3". If you happen to run into her today, you're good. Oh, uh, we get to throw and, Cardi B. And yeah. also want to shout out to Kevin Sona. You are lucky you are in Florida. Uh, Mike, you have might have to pay uh, Mr. Sona a visit. He's probably chained himself down to the ground today in anticipation <laughs> of this uh, opportunity. But, um, uh, Craig, um, uh, you listen, you may want to... Uh, 
uh, you know, change your address or something like that now that you've admitted on the, the broadcast that you're going to go commit domestic violence and elderly abuse at your house. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't thing. say I would throw them and hurt them. I just, you it's, know. It's a, it's a good thing that there's no bail requirements there anymore. <laughs> yes, that is, by the way, folks, that is all a joke. It is all a joke, just in case, you know, someone is out there watching and, you know, I, I don't want Popo showing up to my house. <laughs> All right, all right, before we go, uh, Mr. Schwartz, why don't you let folks know how they can find out, once again, follow uh, the work that you're doing down there in San Diego. If you go to San Diego County GunOwners.com, you can sign up for our email list. You can join, become a member, give us a donation, and help support the important work we're doing. Uh, and, and just see everything. Our, our whole, our, we're, Nothing's a secret. We're an open book, so check out our website. Everything that we do is explained. San Diego County GunOwners.com. Excellent, sir. Excellent, sir. And Mikey, why don't you give a shout out to our sponsors? Uh, hold on. San Diego County GunOwners.com. I'll be on there today joining up as a member. I'm, I'll be your uh, your Florida uh, presentation at the San Diego County Gun Owners. So <laughs> thank you. I'll be on there soon. Uh, I just say shout out to our good friends at uh, Grid Defense, Grid Defense and Guerrilla Manufacturing. Grid Defense, Guerrilla Manufacturing, you need some uh, America's rifle parts. Uh, you look these two guys up and they will they will get you anything you need uh, as long as it doesn't have a serial number on it because they don't do that part of it. So they get you the other 99% of what you need. So check them out today if you want some stuff for your AR. Excellent, folks. Please remember to check out also California Republican Assembly. It is the largest and fastest growing conservative grassroots organization in the state of California, helping to elect conservative Republicans. They are what I like to call the Republican wing of the Republican Party. So check them out today. Uh, that's the California Republican Assembly. Their link is in the description to this video. Well, folks, it has been a lot of fun, but uh, it's come to an end, at least for today. So uh, very much, uh, Mr. Schwartz, appreciate you coming on the program. Uh, Mikey, appreciate you. You know, whoops, I'll see you tomorrow for Freed Back Friday. Woo -woo. Right, folks, remember, please like, share, and subscribe and tell your friends about The Rundown. It is the place to be 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. It is the place to be on YouTube and Facebook. Er day.